I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. This interview is a companion to my episode on absinthe. If you haven't seen that episode, you may want to start there, and there's a link in the card above. I first had the pleasure of meeting Marc Thulier when I traveled to the capital of absinthe, Pontelier, France, for the Absinthe Festival, the year I was completing my work in the history of Hermetic philosophy at the University of Amsterdam. Those were the halcyon days, just a few years after the absinthe ban had been lifted and high quality, historically accurate absinthe was again appearing on the scene. This was also a bit of a pilgrimage for me, as I had been researching absinthe and drinking it on the sly for a few years prior. To enjoy a glass of absinthe in Pontelier in a cafe in the open was just lovely. Mark only cemented that experience for me. Not long prior to the festival that year, one of the largest caches of vintage absinthe ever discovered was found in a barn somewhere in rural France. The absinthe was so well preserved that after a hundred years in the bottle, some of the absinthe still maintained their bright green color. And to boot, they were the most important absinthe of all time, the benchmark of quality, Pernofis. For a small group of us, Mark shared some of this most treasured historical find, and I'll never forget it. As you can probably guess, Mark Thulier is one of the world's leading experts in finding and sampling bottles of absinthe dating from before the French ban in 1915. These bottles are incredibly rare, and each one is a treasure. I actually have one that I was able to purchase from Mark. He also opens bottles to offer samples for sale so that a wider range of absentors can enjoy a couple of glasses from this wonderful period of the Belle Epoque. I have to say I was thrilled to sit down with Mark and discuss vintage and pre-ban absinthe, a shared passion of ours, but also make sure to check out my interview with Ted Bro. He's a pioneer of the absinthe renaissance, an absinthe scientist, or an alchemist, and a master distiller of what is recognized as some of the finest absinthe available today. You can find that interview also in the card above. Also, make sure to check out my other content on magic, the occult, historical alchemy, and hermetic philosophy. I think these are topics most people interested in absinthe tend to share for various reasons. So. I hope you enjoy my chat with Mark Thulier. I'm really excited to be joined by Mark Thulier, one of the world's leading experts in pre-ban vintage absinthe, a very rare commodity indeed. Mark is a collector of absinthe antiques, and he primarily works in the business of very old spirits. When I say very old, I mean spirits dating prior to 1900, and some of them uh, very, very old indeed. He works for uh, absinthe.com, which is actually where I typically tend to order uh, a lot of my absinthe from. They have an, a really wonderful selection of absinthe and they do really reliable, good shipping from Germany. So if you wanna check out their selection, I would recommend it. I'll put a link in the description below. And he is based in the Calvados region there in Normandy. Of course, uh, I also love Calvados, and Mark is also a bit of an expert in Calvados as well, I understand. So Mark, uh, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to Esoterica. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So Mark, let's get right into it. Uh, what is vintage or pre-ban absinthe? What do we mean by vintage or specifically pre-ban absinthe? <laughs> yeah, so... I will make it very simple because we we categorize uh, vintage absinthe in two different categories. Uh, the first one being pre-ban absinthe, which is obviously absinthe being produced before the ban, which happened in 1915 in France and in different dates in other countries. Uh, that's the first one. The second one is what we would call post-ban absinthe, but 
it's it's mainly accents which were produced in Spain after the ban, uh, and specifically in Tarragona in Spain, where Edouard Pernaud established a company in, I think it was about 1912 or something, uh, when they were starting to feel something was going really bad in France. <laughs> so uh, they established a company in Spain to produce absinthe only, while keeping their French company for producing aperitif uh, with anise, but without wormwood. So that's the main two categories. Yeah. And what makes pre-ban absinthe such a uh, uh, such a uh, a wonderful commodity? What makes it so rare? Why why is pre-ban absinthe so sought after by collectors? Uh, I think because because it has this kind of magic in it. Uh, it's unlike other spirits uh, like a cognac or armagnac. It's, it's a spirit that has a very, very strong history. Uh, and even in France, uh, where it was mainly produced, people don't know today uh, uh, why it was banned. Uh, they still believe in crazy things. Um, and they, 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 it has a myth around it, which other spirits don't have. So that's, uh, that's why it, it's, it's so special uh, when people find a, a Prevan bottle, they have absolutely no idea, uh, and I mean French people, uh, they have no idea what it is, uh, value of it, and, and everything about it. Yeah, and I know also um, that you know since it was banned, at least in France in 1915, uh, there are only so many bottles left in the world. And um, I mean, if you were to take a, a guess about how many roughly uh, you would think, how many bottles of absinthe uh, from before the ban still exist in the world, how many do you think that there, there might be in the world? Well, <laughs> no, I know it's a hard question. <laughs> hard question, I would say uh, probably less than a thousand. Okay. Wow. So that's, I mean, that's yeah, a... yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, most, yeah. Most of the bottles were quickly, quickly uh, shipped around the world before the ban. Uh, a lot of them were obviously destroyed um, because the distillery had to destroy their stock. So they were shipping what they could before the ban, and the rest was simply burnt. Uh, and, pe and the few bottles who survived were just hidden in, in strange places uh, just, just so that uh, people could not see them. So uh, that's why it's not, it's not like any other liquor. It, it, it has a, this special history which make people uh, hide them from eyes. Mm. Yeah, so it's wow. So maybe less than a thousand. I mean, it's that's incredibly, uh, incredibly rare um, that to, that they would be so few. Um, how did you get involved? How did you come to? Uh, I mean, you basically have one of the most interesting jobs in the world. Uh, you you hunt down vintage spirits, uh, specifically vintage absinthe. How did you uh, get involved in uh, a job where you where you hunt down vintage absinthe? Oh, it was uh, <laughs> it was because I, I used to be an engineer before uh, a telecom engineer before. But when my company closed its French branch, uh, uh, I knew David Nathan Mester at this time, who was running the virtual absinthe museum on absinthe originals. Uh, so the two, and also the international uh, absent forum, and and so we knew each other already. Uh, we met in Pontarlier. We 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 had some business together, but he he offered me to join him and to start a new company together. He gave me the keys of uh, the virtual of absent museum. He gave me the keys of absent originals. So 
so all his contacts uh, became a sort of mine and uh, and and that's when I started to discover uh, uh, how to unearth some mysterious vintage bottles uh, and 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 the fact that being the main 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 source for vintage absinthe in the world is is um, is a key point because when people find bottles, they Google old absinthe or vintage absinthe or uh, or whatever, and they they find they find us in in 30 seconds and and they contact us immediately because again they don't know what they're owning, they don't know the story behind it, so. <coughs> All they have to do is contact a, uh, a specialist and to understand the value, to understand one of the most asked questions is, is it, string, is it still drinkable? <laughs> and so they just, they just want to know if it's drinkable, if it's sellable, uh, the value, and, um, and, and being one of the only point of contact in the world, it's very easy for us to, to, to buy them. And and what what's the typical range for how much a uh, a bottle of preban absinthe uh, with in, in good condition? What's the what's the range of how much those are typically worth, or how much they typically sell for? Uh, depending on the brown, uh, I think I can honestly say that the cheapest one I've sold was uh, preban only. I'm not talking about the Spanish production, which is half the price or even less than half the price uh it it ranges from 2000 euros to the most expensive one was something like 5 6000 uh, so 2000 of up, upwards of 5000 to 6000 euros um how does that compare to other vintage spirits so if one were to find uh, a bottle of cognac or armagnac or uh, or something like that from roughly the same time period. What's the what's the rough comparison in terms of value? So I would say I would say first you can compare it to cognac from the same period. The price would be approximately the same, uh, or or. Cognac would be a little cheaper. Armagnac would be less, less cheaper because because it's it's not so popular than cognac. Uh, among all the French spirits made at the same period, I can only think of one which is way more expensive than absinthe. It's Chartreuse, uh, and, uh, and especially over the last years, last months, it's becoming really, really crazy. Like. Like it's very hard to buy a bottle now. Um, <clears throat> uh, to give you a, a, a very good example, uh, it was only last week. Uh, a shot was from 1910-1934, so the period 1910-1934, sold for on auction uh, on a public auction uh, for 14,000 euros, including auction fees. Wow. So, yeah, so, so, and it's only from 1910, 1934. It's not uh, a 19th century bottle. Uh, so, <clears throat> that's the only French period that is really going crazy in terms of price. Uh, and so, I would, I would put absinthe as a second one, and then you can put cognac, armagnac, and everything else after this list. Wow. Yeah, I've also noticed that even the uh, the Tarragona Chartreuse has also gotten very, very expensive recently. So, oh yes, yes, because some some people because Chartreuse is really tuned a lot, even including all the vintage ones. It's really for immediate consumption. People are buying them not as a collectible piece, but really to drink them. Um, and so you have customers for. French artworks, and you have just really a lot of customers who are fans of the Spanish ones. Yeah. Tell us, uh, tell uh, a couple of uh, your favorite stories of some of uh, where you found some of these pre-banned bottles of absinthe. 
Um, I'd, yeah, I'd love to hear a couple of stories of some of the, the stranger places that people have uh, uh, that found absinthe. Oh, 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 I have, I have to, I have to. Uh, the first one was in uh, in Burgundy. Uh, in so I went there, uh, and that was a very nice family, uh, a mother on on her own mother who were running the house and um, we had such a lovely long discussion about the history of the house, the history of the family. And it was funny to to know that uh, the house was part of big distillery back in 1850, uh, which were not producing absinthe, unfortunately, but they was producing all other kinds of spirit, herbal spirits, cognac, everything. And um, so you have to know that in Burgundy, uh, they have typical closets, which are built-in closets in walls, which are not reachable for a child or even for a small person. And they are usually located in bedrooms and living rooms. And that's where they, so as it's inside the wall, they are almost invisible. And that's where they hide uh, uh, what is not for children, I would say. So firearms, uh, uh, alcohol, uh, and maybe tobacco or things like that. And that's exactly in such a closet in a bedroom uh, that the grandmother found while cleaning or searching for stuff. I can't remember exactly, but uh, it was a perfect coincidence. She found many, many vintage alcohol bottles, including five bottles of uh, absent Pernofis and five bottles of absent Juno. And uh, so, <coughs> so that was, that was really, really funny that th these bottles were staying in this closet for so many years without even being noticed. <laughs> and, um, uh, and the third story is, is more recently we found um, a cache of absinthe roman and uh, it was a house um, <clears throat> which was um, uh, so it was sold to uh, an old man and the old man was just wondering why uh, the house was smaller than shown in the architect plans and the reason was quite simple there was a new wall built somewhere, which was built during World War II, just to hide all their stash of alcohol. And that was including, that was including many bottles of, um, uh, many Demi Jones and bottles of absent Roman, uh, uh, just, just to hide them from Germans. Wow, so they, they literally walled up uh, their alcohol to, to, to save it from the Nazis. Yes, because, <laughs> yes, because, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> Germans, uh, Germans had, uh, were used to visit houses and borrow all the alcohol they could find uh, in houses everywhere in France. So people were used to hide them in strange places or to even build walls <laughs> to hide them. Wow. Wow, that's amazing! That the uh, to find, yeah, to just to knock a wall down and find uh, a hundred-year-old bottle of absinthe uh, hidden behind a, a wall. That's, uh, but one can one can dream. One can dream. Uh, I found a <laughs> I, I knocked a wall down in my house actually when we were doing some renovations, and actually found a uh, bottle of whiskey uh, that had been stuck there. And I, as soon as I saw it in the wall, I prayed that it still had whiskey in it, but it was sadly, sadly empty. So, oh, so no, no luck, no luck. Um, why do you, so Mark, why do you think these, uh, aside from just accident, uh, do you think these bottles have survived for any other reason other than just the accident of history? Well, most of the time, most of the time they, they were really hidden in, strange places and in, I would say, in the darkest corner of their cellars, in, 
in the far in the far far place in a closet. Uh, in, um, it's always the same story from from my um, from my experience. It was always always the case. He, he, um, when someone uh, of the family will die, the children <laughs> will visit the house and clean it, and will find many bottles first, but the absent bottles are always found uh, uh, in strange places, always. I, I, I guess that's fitting for uh, uh, for a spirit that has such a reputation for being strange that it would be found in the strangest places. So I guess that's, <laughs> I guess that's fitting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, Mark, uh, this is a, maybe a, a bit of a more controversial question. Since the legalization of absence, both in the European Union and in the United States and in many other places, there's been a, a real explosion in people making absence again for the first time, authentic absence, uh, including uh, using uh, Artemisia absinthium, using wormwood and the, the standard classical ingredients. Do you think there's a difference between pre-ban absence and uh, modern absence. And I ask this because one of the things I've often wondered about is whether the cultivars of the plants, like wormwood, like the wormwood that was grown in, for instance, Pontelier, if the, the, the cultivars of the plants have, have changed over the past hundred years, are the herbs slightly different over the past hundred years? I'm just wondering from your experience, do you think that modern absence being made now and the absence that was produced perhaps 100 and 50 years ago, do you think they're the same or do you think that uh, pre-ban absinthe is somehow slightly different? Well, I'm glad you said different because I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that uh, uh, it was better of, or made with better herbs or something, but they are definitely different. Um, and I agree with you about the cultivars because because the cultivars have changed over the decades because of plagues, because of insects, they had to survive too. And uh, so they they are indeed different. Uh, one of the best examples I can take is, uh, as we know, the holy trinity in absinthe is wormwood, green anise, and fennel. And <laughs> in pre and absinthe, most of them, not all of them, of course, but green anise compared to modern ones is just outstanding. Uh, and, and green anise being the main ingredient in absence, unlike what we think, it's not wormwood, but it's green anise. Um, uh, uh, what what is really coming out of a vintage absinthe glass is is a pure, rich fruity quality of green anise and it's very it's 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 my favorite ingredient <laughs> and it's very 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 hard to find a good one today even if you because it was imported from spain back in the days and even if you import it from spain today it won't be the same it's not you can find a very rich one very very fruity but it still won't be the same, <laughs> and that's 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 the main difference uh, I found between between preban and uh, modern absent. It doesn't again. It doesn't mean that modern absent are of lesser quality because I know some small producers who are sourcing really great great herbs and are making superb products. Uh, but as you said. Cultivars are different, so you can't expect uh, it to be the same. Right, and I and I and I've, I've noticed that too. And I remember I've had my my share of of pre ban absence, obviously not nearly as much as, as you. And it's one of the things that's always struck me drinking pre ban absence. Uh, in the cases that I do, is that exactly that uh, bit about the anise that the that the green anise is so much more uh, floral uh, and and uh, fragrant when you uh, pour a glass of vintage absinthe. It is amazing how uh, 
how much more floral they are, even compared to, in some cases, even very good modern absence. Mm, yeah, yeah. So, um, what's your favorite uh, vintage uh, absinthe or pre-band absinthe that you've had? You probably, uh, you've probably tasted more pre-band absinthe than almost, I, I would say, more than any human being on the planet. I, I, at least your top two or three for sure. Um, you're the you have uh, an incredibly uh, unique ability to to evaluate uh, dozens perhaps of pre-band absence what's what's your favorite and why mm, that's very very no that's very easy to answer because it will <laughs> <laughs> among uh, among the among i don't know how many i've tested i think uh, close to 50 uh uh, close to 50 different ones and um, my favorite will always always be Edouard Pernod by far <laughs> and the reason is Pernod Fils uh, we've tested some Pernod Fils which was still green and was fantastic but uh, Pernod Fils was a great brown it was it was really uh, rich uh, very floral very very fruity and and we tend to call it uh, a feminine drink, <laughs> uh, whereas Edouard Pernod is really more into the notes of uh, laser wood. Uh, you see something more masculine, and and that's only because uh, they were using a much better wine alcohol base, and they were probably aging it for a longer period. On maybe in better barrels uh, than pen of fish. Um, and the the difference the difference between the two is striking uh, in terms of aging process. Uh, the wine alcohol used by Edouard Pernot is really really of <coughs> of better quality and and uh, and, uh, and and what comes out are, are those, um, yes, wooden, yeah, not of wood, laser, uh, 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 cigar, and all sorts of things like, like this. And Edward Pernod was, I think, right, the second largest producer after Pernod Fils. Mm, probably. Probably. Yeah. And it, I think, I mean, I think my favorite that I've had is probably uh, CF Burger, which I think was the largest in Switzerland, I believe. Yeah, they were in Switzerland and France later. Yeah, they, were, they established in in France in Marseille. Uh, yeah, which is which is really good too. But uh, but it, there's there's something so special in Edouard Pernod that I, I a quality. Yes, let's say a quality that I can't find in any other ones. What's the most unusual uh, pre-band absinthe that you've had? You know, we hear all these uh, stories about you know absinthe uh, being made in, in pre-band times, especially very cheap absinthe being uh, colored with copper sulfate and uh, these sort of stories that they people put all these chemicals in uh, very poor quality absinthe. But I was wondering if you've ever come across any of those Poor quality absinthe, mm. or uh, what is the most I, uh, unusual absinthe you've had? No, I, I think I can answer yes because I run things I maybe shouldn't have <laughs> <laughs> for my health because because they were they were clandestine things. I I've tested some clandestine French absinthe and some clandestine Swiss absinthe, which were made. Uh, 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 in in the early 1800, and they were really really special. You you you. It all comes from the the alcohol they were using was really something they were importing from I don't know where, but <laughs> it was it was really wild. That's yeah. I, well, I think. Yeah, thank you for risking your uh, your health so that we can uh, know more about these pre-band uh, absence. Yeah, I, I, I've had some uh, uh, some uh, clandestine 
uh, absence from also from Switzerland, and I've I've wondered about the the quality of the alcohol too. That uh, it, sometimes the, the alcohol tastes so hot, and you're like, I don't know if this is really good for me or not. Um, but I guess that's the risk. <laughs> I, remember, I remember. I remember. I uh, remember uh, the bottle that was sold. Uh, that was sold in some polls. Uh, that was maybe 15 years ago. Um, so it was a clandestine Swiss absent, uh, and and the samples were already sold, and the absent was analyzed after being sold, and the owner had to had to contact back all the people he sold the sample to to tell them, don't drink this. It's it's. <laughs> the anethyl content is way, way, way too high for your health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah, that's what happens when you drink clandestine absinthe. Uh, you can, you can get, um, yeah, you, it's, it's, uh, it's not for your, not healthy. Uh, Mark, mm -hmm. what, should, what should someone do if they find um, a bottle of vintage absinthe in their house or a bottle of vintage spirits uh, in general? Uh, what would you? What would be your advice uh, if someone were to make a discovery like that? <clears throat> because, uh, because as I said, in even in France, people don't really know anything about it. What what they will do is just Google it and um, and and contact people like me. Uh, uh, that's not something. What I want to say is that's unlike cognac or. Or Armagnac or Chartreuse. It's not something if you find, let's say, ten bottles of <clears throat> of Preben Pernofis. It's not something that, that, unlike cognac, you will bring to a auction house saying, "Hello, guys, I found ten bottles of this uh, old spirit. Uh, please sell them for me for me on auction," um, um, because the auction house is no nothing but absent. So. They can take any other spirit you will find in your house, but don't ever offer them vintage absinthe. Uh, it's much better to contact people uh, <coughs> who knows, who really knows uh, the story, uh, the history, and uh, and and the value. Uh, that's as yeah, simple that, as that. that. To that point, Mark, I think I've seen sometimes uh, closed auctions online where someone's put a bottle of uh, Perner Edouard uh, up for sale. And I think it sold two bottles, I think sold for, I think I saw it for 111 euro or something, um, which I, I, I wish I could have, uh, I wish I could have. I remember, oh, I remember this one. I learned about it after the auction closed and I was really furious. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I yeah. basically yeah, just it... wanted to break down and cry looking at a two, and I think they were still wrapped in the original <laughs> paper. I was like, I exactly, remember. exactly. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was coming from uh, a, I can't remember where, but it was from a store in the U, in the US, if I'm correct. That and, might be um, right. Yeah, they were, yeah, they were, uh, yeah, they were still wrapped in the original tissue paper, beautiful bottles of Edward Pernod. Uh, oh, yeah, that was quite frustrating. Yeah, I, I, I shed a tear, I think, uh, looking at that. I wonder who got those bottles. Have you ever heard anything about who bought, who managed to get those two uh, bottles for 100 euro? Uh, yes, because if I remember correctly, the people who buy them uh, contacted me just after <laughs> to say, look, I bought them. Uh, I think I think it's someone, I think it's someone from our absent community, but I I really can't remember who it was a long time ago. I can't remember. Well, well, I hope they found a good home because they were just beautiful. Yes. So, Mark, what are, what other kinds of vintage spirits or absinthe uh, antiques have you found uh, that you found to be interesting? And what's the oldest thing that you've uh, that you've come across in your uh, in your in your searches for these sort of things? Oh. I think uh, uh, the thing we are, we are really proud of is we found um, what we still believe because nobody uh, shown anything older than that since uh, is the oldest cognac bottle uh, on earth. 
which is from um, 1738. Uh, so that's really, really old. Wow. And we have no proof uh, of anything older which would exist in the world. Uh, so that's, yeah, yeah, that's one thing. The oldest of some uh, cognac bottle in the world. Uh, and, and, and maybe the, one of the oldest uh, absinthe bottles that I sold to the absinthe museum in Moitié, uh, which were, they were really, really happy about it uh, to, to see that absinthe Dubiet was coming back in Switzerland uh, after 200 years um, because it was, it was produced in the Val de Travers at this time and it was coming back to the Val de Travers and it's now uh, in their museum uh, in Moutier. Uh, so that was, that was a very, very interesting find on, on the fact that it was going to, uh, to the place where it was produced initially was, was really, really a nice thing for me. Wow, that's really beautiful. Yeah, that that bottle of Dubiet was really. I remember when I re I remember reading about that when you guys found it. That was really nice. Um, that's really beautiful. So, Mark, how would uh, you enjoy a glass of Preban Absinthe if you were to pour yourself a glass of uh, of Edward Pernod, uh, How would you how would you enjoy that glass of Preban Absinthe? Um. Good question because uh, because most most absenters, uh, most purists tend to say uh, vintage absent equals no sugar, and I totally disagree with it for a simple reason. If you have enough to try two glasses, just try one without sugar. Just try the other one with a little piece of sugar, and. I won't say that one will be better than the other one, but they will definitely be different. Uh, you will have upfront notes in one, which would be maybe the alcohol base, uh, the, um, uh, the bitterness, uh, the coloration herbs. And the other one with sugar, you will have upfront notes of, uh, of green anise, of flowers, of uh, candies uh, uh, and all the sweet aspect of it. So one will be different from, from the other, but not, it will not, one will not be better than the other. That's what I mean. And the other thing is, is to be <laughs> very, very, very careful with uh, the ratio dilution. So when you add your water, I always suggest to people to, to start with a ratio of one part absent for two parts uh, ice cold water, they test it. Maybe, most probably, they will find it a bit strong in terms of alcohol. So what I say is just add a little bit more water step by step. You test again, because the problem with vintage absent is as soon as you've reached this, how could I put that, uh, the, the water limit, uh, we say it's say noyé in French. So mm. it's, uh, <laughs> you see what I mean? Uh, it's, it's already too late. And, right. and what, you, what you will test is something uh, like a syrup, a syrup with water. Uh, you don't have, you don't have this problem with modern absent, except except some which are very, very sensitive to the to the water dilution. But in vintage absent, it's really, really a critical thing uh, that I found that because it happened to me, uh, and because of the price and the rarity, you don't want to ruin to ruin your glass. And it happened to me maybe once or twice, and it's like you don't have a a, a, a beautiful glass of vintage absinthe anymore. You have something that is flat, and mm. not undrinkable, but so flat that you won't enjoy it. So, so yeah, my only advice is 
be really, really careful with water. Makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I often think that somewhere in between like about a one to three ratio is typically where I find I, I, I typically like that ratio, but you're you're right to point out that every absinthe is going to be is going to be quite different one to the other. So uh, figuring out exactly where that ratio is is requires a bit of experimentation. Yeah, yeah, and it and you you won't take any risk by drinking it with 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 a little <laughs> with a, um, less water. It it will it will just be a bit too strong for you, but it it will be wonderful in test whereas mm. if you test it with too much water as i said it will just be flat and and you have you really ruined uh, a good glass of absinthe yeah and that can be a very expensive uh very expensive mistake uh how about how much yes. does uh, a glass of vintage pre-band absinthe uh cost if if uh if you were to calculate just in typical on average how much would a glass of pre-band absinthe cost a person these days? Oh, I would say, uh, so, so you mean if you buy a sample today and make a glass from it, for example? Yeah, if you were to, uh, if you were to either uh, buy an entire bottle or if you were to buy, for instance, I know that on, uh, you also sell uh, samples of pre-band absinthe. Yes. Uh, give, just to give people a, a general sense, if someone were to buy a sample or, or from a bottle, typically how much would a, a glass of your favorite, like Perno Edouard uh, or Perno Fis, how much would those cost per glass in your estimate? Uh, it, it will cost you around, uh, uh, let's say, $100. A big glass because that's that's the only that's the other thing I forgot to mention. But uh, when I prepare a vintage absinthe glass, I I never use a small dose. Some I know people do it because they want to drink. Uh, let's say from 50 milliliters, they will they will make two glasses because they want to save it for later. Uh, I just can't do that. If I prepare one. It's it's four centiliters always uh, because you, because of the risk of uh, over diluting it once again. Uh, so I never take this risk, uh, and I always use a, a big dose. Um, so that's why I would say that a big dose, so a perfect dose for me personally, of four centiliters would be <coughs> would cost you around. One hundred dollars, right? So about a hundred dollars for a uh, solid glass of vintage, of vintage absinthe, pre-band absinthe. What's your favorite kind of glass uh, to drink vintage absinthe out of? Do you prefer vintage glasses like old Pontellier, the heavy glass uh, glasses, or do you prefer uh, a modern type of glass? What's your favorite type of glass to drink absinthe out of? Uh, <laughs> I have to I have to admit that I usually use always the same modern glass because for a simple reason because they have been made especially to have a four centiliter dose. So uh, I know that I know how to fill it. I know I know how to uh, how much water I will add into it. It's so it's. Um, yeah, it's perfect for me. Whereas problem with vintage glasses, uh, for example, the Pontarly glasses, which who has um, a, a, a delimited dose, uh, they never have the same dose from one glass to the other, obviously, because they were hand blown and because some of them had more quantity of glass than others. So sometimes those, I've seen those of two centiliters, I've seen doses of uh, three, four centiliters, but it's never the same. So, uh, uh, so unless you find the perfect glass, vintage glass with the perfect dose you like, uh, uh, you you will you will never know. So that's why I prefer to use a, a modern one which has a really fixed dose, 
And if I break it, I buy another one, <laughs> and it will have exactly the same dose. That's what I mean. Um, uh, I don't want to risk breaking any of my vintage glass. <laughs> Yeah, I've had, I've, def, I've certainly had the experience of having had uh, a few glasses of absinthe and unfortunately dropping a a, a vintage glass or or, uh, or rinsing them with really hot water and they'll get a crack. So I totally agree that the hazard of using we want to have our vintage glasses, but we don't want to use them, which is always the um, uh, I don't know the worry because um, these glasses, of course, can cost yeah. several hundred euros. Yeah, and funny, that's funny your story about the. Uh, the, clack, uh, the crack in the glass while washing it because it happened to someone I know, not on vintage glass, in, in vintage glass, but on a vintage Preban fountain. Oh God, that's <laughs> oh, uh, uh, t yeah, a term the terminus one, which is one of oh, the most with, expensive. Uh, with the rooster on top. Uh, yes, and the, uh, um, the fountain was just in like in new condition. And oh, the, the funny thing is, he was he was having some drinks with his friends, so everything was perfect. Ice cold water on the fountain. Then he went to the kitchen just to rinse it. Nothing else. He rinsed it. He left it on the table, and as soon as he turned around, he heard. That's terrible. <laughs> so that's, that's too fast. <laughs> What three three thousand euros yeah. sometimes? Yeah, yeah, uh, and at the time it happened to him because the price have really dropped since. Uh, now I w yeah now I would say between two thousand five hundred three hundred but uh, uh, three thousand sorry, but at the time it was it was more in the five four five thousand range. Yeah, I know. I I I used to have one of the old. Uh, Fountains for the it was I think it it was post band it was the the ones that are typically marked with uh, J R I had one of those for a while yeah, but I was, always, I was always scared to use it because I I think a lot of those filters are actually made of asbestos aren't they exactly exactly yeah, yeah I, I I remember uh, Ted Bro who I'm also doing an interview with he has one of these old fountains and I remember us picking it up and I'm looking at the filter and I was like, Ted, I think that might be asbestos in there. I don't really think we should be using this fountain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, on the lead, the lead content is just insane uh, yeah. in the um, in the spigot. So, yeah, it's really not healthy. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend uh, yeah, using them. Um, so... Mark, we've talked a lot about the the past and in uh, terms of absence, in terms of the pre ban period. Well, we're now living in a period where absence is is re legal. People are enjoying absence. Uh, what do you think the future of absence looks like? Hmm, that's a good question because unfortunately, I don't see it very well uh, because because you and I were right in the middle of the absent explosion uh, in the early 2000. Uh, and since then, uh, we've seen, we've unfortunately seen people uh, deserting uh, forums and, and losing interest in something that was so new uh, 20 years ago, and which is just uh, another normal spirit now today uh, so it's i would say that it lost its magic uh, mm. uh yeah really uh it's it if you remember like 15 20 years ago when something new when a new absent was produced uh you had hundreds of forum pages about this uh when a new vintage bottle was found you had hundreds of pages talking about it, uh, whereas now <laughs> you get you get a very few uh, interest uh, in in new things being distilled or being found. Wow! So there was a, there was sort of an explosion in, in the because I remember back I was got into absinthe I think in the late '90s, 
uh, Ted Bro and I uh, got really into it. And then I remember through the mid 2000s when things got legalized, there was a huge boom. And then ironically, that was exactly when I lost interest in absence was during the big boom. And it's only in recent years that I've gotten back into it and really been overwhelmed with uh, the quality and quantity of how much absence stuff is out there now. So it's a pity to, to you know, hear that sort of there was kind of a boom and a bit of a bust, but I think there'll be people like us who are um, the hardcore that will remain interested in, in <coughs> quite some time. Yeah, but it was the thing is it was it was already it's always been a niche market, a niche product, and 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 so it they thought people saw that because it it's now in. Uh, American bars uh, used as a as a cocktail ingredient, which is which is something totally new. Uh, we couldn't have imagined ten years ago. Uh, it's now in in cocktails all around the world. In uh, in Japan bars, I have many customers in Japan. It's in Japan bars. It's in um, American bars everywhere. Uh, so uh, uh, big companies such as Perno. Uh, <laughs> when they when they really still absent a few years ago, they they, they really really still eat four cocktails, and thinking that absent will will be the next uh, um, spirit to explode all around the world, and uh, and it's clearly not uh, because because even in cocktails it's used like like what one two drops per cocktail because it's so overpowering that it can't it can't really replace another ingredient um <coughs> uh, so so yes they were they were all thinking that uh, the cocktail thing will will make a, a big boom in the absent world uh, no it's still a niche product which is which is which is okay for us uh, i mean our community didn't want from right from the beginning that Absent became uh, uh, famous all around the world and became a mainstream. No, we 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 just wanted it to stay to stay a niche product, to have some nice discussions about it, uh, about the new products, about about the new vintage being found and everything, uh, and. Um, but still, yeah, still, uh, it's uh, it's something that it's not so magical today that it used to be 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, I remember when I was there at the at Pontelier uh, for the Absence Festival. I remember just the excitement of of what was going on, and I think that you also brought then uh, uh, some vintage absence. It was that green. Uh, Pernod that you guys found that was still green. I think it's the, uh, to my knowledge, that's the only one found uh, that that maintained its green color. It didn't become the oil more. Yeah, color. that's from. Yeah, that's that's from uh, the cache we picked up with David in in the Do region. Uh, so the Do region is where Pontarlier is, uh, the mm -hmm. capital, uh, the capital of absent of the 19th century. So. Yeah, we picked up this cache of 76 bottles in a, in a farm in the middle of the mountains. It was a fantastic trip, a fantastic moment. Uh, imagine drinking a glass of steel green pernofis uh, outside in the middle of the mountain. It was just fantastic. Uh, I think that was the best vintage absent glass I had in my life because wow. of the context. Uh, because of the context, because of uh, of, of of just uh, picking up uh, such a big, which the biggest absent cash uh, uh, ever found. Yeah, I remember at Pontelier when you had some there, uh, you, we poured a glass and passed it around, and I remember it stumped everybody because uh, we were so used to vintage absence, pre-band absence being, of course, the foil mort, the brown color. Uh, and I remember trying it and thinking, there's something strange about this absinthe. This is not new absinthe. And I remember thinking, I think this is vintage. And I, I think I looked at you and said, I think it's vintage. And you were like, yeah, yeah. I remember you nodding at me being like, yeah, it, it is. It's it's actually vintage. And I'm like, wow, this is incredible to find an absinthe that's still green 
after a hundred years uh, being stored away somewhere. So it was a magical experience to, to try that absinthe. Mm -hmm. so. Well, Mark, I am uh, really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to take a Friday afternoon to talk about uh, our shared passion of, of pre-ban, of absinthe and pre-ban absinthe in, in general. So thank you so much for, for coming on the show. And uh, if folks, where can people find you? Where can people find you if they want to buy some pre-ban absinthe or if they find some pre-ban absinthe, where can people find you? Oh, oh, they can just contact me via, uh, via uh, absintheoriginals.com and just contact me and feel free to ask me any question uh, about anything. I'm always, always pleased to answer people about all kind of questions and and just don't just don't think that your question will be stupid or anything. I, I, I really I promise you I answer to every question with a great pleasure because I really don't want people to to have a misconception about absent about its history. Uh, and everything around it. Uh, uh, I prefer to spend time uh, and write long emails explaining <coughs> proper things so that Absent has a better image all around the world, uh, and including in France, because even, even French <coughs> still think that Absent was driving people crazy. So, so it's good, it's good to, to give a little educa education to to people and even to French people. Yeah, and I'll also say before we end that uh, people who are interested in pre-ban absence, I really would recommend you contact uh, Mark because uh, there actually is a good bit of fraudulent pre-ban absence that appears on the market from once in a, every once in a while. Uh, I think I've seen a couple of different bottles uh, that I looked at. Someone offered me a bottle a couple of years ago out of the UK. And I, I remember looking at the pictures and thinking, yeah, that's definitely fake, like the, the wax or something look really wrong. And um, so there's, <laughs> a, so fake, fake uh, vintage absinthe is out there. Is that, is that, is that your experience, Mark? Oh, yes, there was, there was one, especially one man who were making them uh, with a mix of different products. So he was making kind of his Tarragona with uh, essence of absinthe the bush essence of absinthe and with another modern uh, with a modern absinthe so it was three or four different ingredients all together uh, and uh, and we caught we simply caught him because this man was so stupid to buy uh, vintage uh, i mean an empty vintage absinthe bottle on from ebay uh, on day one on on day four, he was already selling it. He was already selling it full with a wax seal and with a bit of dust on it and everything uh, to our own, to his own community, to our small community. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like like a few days after buying it empty on eBay. So so so. Uh, three or four of us uh, went to a, to a separate chat. We created a separate chat, and every day we were we were like policemen. We were looking <laughs> really like policemen. We were looking for pictures on the internet, on on old, on previous sales on eBay, on everything. And we found, if I remember correctly, we found like. Uh, Five or yeah, four or five blatant proof of his fakes. So photos of the exact same bottle empty, photos of the exact same bottle full. Wow. Yeah, I so again I recommend to people that if you if you're interested in buying uh prevent absinthe, uh, I really would recommend that you go to, to Mark's website and contact Mark because again uh, there is also fraudulent uh, absinthe out there. Of course, there's a market for it, and uh, it, you know, going for a hundred dollars a glass or several thousand euros for a bottle that, in certain, uncertain, unfortunately, incentivizes fraud. And uh, people like Mark are experts in the field and provide 
um, a, a, a guarantee that what they're what they're selling is absolutely authentic. So I would really ha highly recommend folks to um, yeah to trust to go to trusted sources to buy these kinds of products if you're going to be investing that kind of money uh, in in absinthe. Mark, thank you again so much for taking the time to come on Esoterica and sharing um, some really esoteric knowledge about uh, an esoteric spirit, absinthe, that uh, not only absinthe, but uh, absinthe from before the ban. This is a, a really wonderful conversation and just a really wonderful glimpse into uh, a world that most people don't have much access to at all, if they even know it exists. And so to know that not only is there good absinthe out there, but there is in fact uh, pre-ban absinthe that could have been enjoyed by you know someone like Rimbaud or uh, uh, the, you know, Monet or something that that absinthe is still out there and still can be can be that that absinthe is still out there and still can be had uh, at least for the right price. So, Mark, thank you so much again for chatting with me this afternoon. Thank you, Justin. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed our chat. I've included links in the description below if you want to find Mark or even sample some fine vintage spirits or perhaps even a glass or two of pre-ban vintage absinthe. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge and you've been watching Esoterica where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.